On Friday, both Marceline and Fallen Grace sat on the bus traveling to the ferry. The bus was a normal bus, a bit short, only six rows long, but every row had a charging station for phones, and most importantly, Marceline had privacy while the bus made other stops in, within River City before heading to the ferry. Looking around and knowing that no one was paying attention to a woman as unassuming as Marceline Genevieve Pierce, she opened the outer pocket on her jacket and peered inside. Laying there inside with her own phone was Fallen Grace, Marceline's big sister. She was adopted by Marceline when she was young, and despite all of her mischief, she was a great sister, even though they couldn't look any more different. Where Fallen Grace was white with blonde straight hair, Marceline was black with dark curls. Where Fallen Grace had pale skin with borderline microscopic freckles, Marceline had dark brown skin without freckles. Where Fallen Grace dressed like a punk with mini tank tops and ripped doll jeans, Marceline dressed more conservatively, choosing skirts and blouses. Where Marceline was quiet and thought before she acted, Fallen Grace was usually loud and acted without thought at all. And where Marceline was a witch with her own magic, Fallen Grace was a four inch tall fairy with broken wings. Peering into her pocket, Marceline nodded to her sister, who responded by laying back and lifting both hands fists up with the middle finger extended while she lightly kicked Marceline's chest. Clearly, she was very bored, even with her miniature phone. Her wings buzzed lightly behind her for a moment. Most Florian fairies had four wings, two on each side, similar to a dragonfly, that allowed to them to fly with great speed and stability in all three dimensions. Fallen Grace's bottom two wings were torn away a long time ago, the stumps hidden by her tank top. Her two remaining wings were still visible, but she wasn't able to fly with them by normal means. It would barely get her a few feet at a time before she would need to land again. But fortunately, she didn't need her wings to fly, but she was still very sensitive about the topic. So Marceline, usually, didn't bring it up. But in that moment, she was considering how rude Fallen Grace was towards her. You know you didn't have to pay anything for this trip. The least you could do is be patient. Marceline whispered to her big little sister, who only responded by sticking her tongue out and calling out with her quiet voice. She was louder than one would think for such a small fairy, but she was still quieter than normal human speech. You know, you didn't pay for this either. By that logic, you should be hiding also, Fallen Grace said before kicking Marceline's chest again before turning back to her, her tiny phone. An advanced piece of nanotechnology with all the functions of a smartphone at less than 1% the mass, and Fallen Grace was still addicted to it. On one hand, it made some sense. She didn't have very many friends who were fae, and most Tippecam couldn't handle the idea of a fairy being real. At least, not without causing harm to Fallen Grace. But she still found a way to earn an income, and most months, she would actually surpass what Marceline could ever make as a private detective. Her source of income? Social media. Specifically through Share My Day a platform that thrived off of videos and photos, primarily, with some text posts. It turned out while most Tippecam couldn't handle the idea of a fairy being real, they could handle the idea of a fairy through social media and would watch her videos of her struggling to do tasks in a world too big for her, or watch her pretend to be a perfect pretty hissy pixie princess persona. In all the years Marceline had known Fallen Grace, the only thing that was accurate about her persona was that she was a princess. But the persona sold well, advertising for her videos were high, and she also made money making personalized greetings for others. While Marceline didn't understand how that all made Fallen Grace so much money, she was willing to accept it but she wouldn't want to be in the fairy's place when the tax collectors came to collect coin owed to Caesar. 
already Fallen Grace was recording a video in the pocket and curious about what her sister was whispering, Marceline put in her headphones and turned on her phone to listen to her big sister's video. While well, here you can see my one star transportation, Mark decided to hide me away in a pocket to save money. She said those last words with air quotes. It's not my fault there's only one ticket, but come on, there's got to be somewhere more comfortable than a pocket. What, were you out of cages, boxes, and suitcases? Do better next time, sis, Fallen Grace said. Marceline responded by closing her pocket, plunging the pixie into darkness. On the video, she was plunged into darkness for a moment before she turned on her phone's light and continued to speak. Well, that was awfully rude. But yes, we're on our way to the ferry. Hopefully I can show all of you beautiful people more of Isle City that way. I've never been, but I hear it's beautiful. Fun fact though, Isle City was founded by merchants from Karts Kadash who needed a settlement to act as a halfway point between the continents of Vespucci and Sealy. It's the second oldest Europa settlement on the continent of Vespucci, just after Vinland itself. Nowadays, it's famous for its beautiful beaches, the coastal guardians, and astounding islands. Despite the name implying the territory all being on one island, the territory of Isle City covers over 2,000 unique islands, keys, and archipelagos, many of which them are still unmapped by humanity, making Isle City the largest city of the Empire in the Seven Cities. But be sure to stay tuned if you don't want to miss more of these mysterious islands unraveled. Fallen Grace finished before ending her livestream, and just in time for the bus to finish and arrive at the ferry. The end of the Mississippi River that gave River City its name met the Tano Sea in a large delta that had thousands of ships and boats everywhere. Some were small crafts meant to carry one family out into the harbor, Others were medium paddle boats that allowed gambling, when in River City, gambling was only allowed on the water. Then there were ships that both gave birth and kept River City alive. Large tankers that carried goods to the Swamp City and Cathedral City to the north, but also followed the city out to the Tano Sea to bring other goods to Isle City, Imperial City, and Garden City all along the coast. Unfortunately, with all this industry, also brought foul smells. The smell of dead foul fish, the ship sludge, human waste, garbage, smoke, grease, and gods know what else, all made the pair to the ferry smell very strongly. Holding her nose, Marceline made her way to the ferry boat. The Amerigo was the name of the ferry. Already, a few dozen people were there, and Marceline showed her ticket to the man in the front of the boat, who simply waved her along. Apparently, no one here has heard about what happened on the Naglafari. Red whispered to herself, before Marceline caught herself. Red was not supposed to be out yet. If she didn't guard her thoughts, she might be thinking as Red all the time, which was a thought that terrified Marceline, but excited the Red Prince. The Amerigo had a large cabin with seats and air conditioning for the passengers that wanted it. It was already crowded by the time Marceline got there, but Marceline much preferred being on the seats on the outside. In addition to seeing the sea that Marceline enjoyed, she also enjoyed the fresh air and the feel of the breeze. Plus, it was a lot easier to hide Fallen Grace out here. Less people meant less likely for anyone to see Fallen Grace. Plus, Marceline wasn't comfortable being around so many people that she didn't know. Out on the deck, she could watch the sea for the next few hours. She watched as the gray waters of the River City Delta gave way to the deep, mysterious blue of the Tano Sea. The sea that gave birth to nations, but could also just as easily drown them in a single day. The ferry visited stop after stop, First to some of the island nations that populated the Tano Sea, and then it traveled to Isle City itself. Here the blue lightened and Marceline could see the bottom of the ocean, 
where manatees, turtles, stingrays, and am other amazing creatures all swam with all the joy and safety of the world. Peering over the deck, Marceline noticed as she looked closely, she could see some of the more hidden creatures of Isle City, those that preferred staying on their side of the veil. Moving with an aggregation of manatees, Marceline could see long straight hair, dark skin, and bright scales moving with the manatees. The mermaid, careful not to be seen too closely by human eyes. Marceline could also see just below the sand the slight movement of something very large, very ancient, and very powerful. As it continued to sleep and dream of the world before man, likely to sleep until man was long since gone. Marceline could also see on the distant horizon ship graveyards that contained vessels from every era and every nation, areas that were far too dangerous for anyone to even attempt to visit. The wreckage too dangerous to ever salvage by man, but used by the sea to turn the gray steel into colorful coral. Still, the ferry moved forward, and more and more people were left in it until it was just Marceline and Fallen Grace, who had fallen bored and asleep hours ago. The sun continued to set behind Marceline as she saw more and more evidence of the darkness behind the veil as it neared the ferry. She could see large pointed rocks, each of them almost large enough to be an island overgrown with lichen and seabirds, but as the ferry passed by, she could see that what she thought was a chain of large rocks was actually the ancient spine of a large, long-dead sea creature, so large that even in death its body was an ecosystem. The ferry passed sandbars that once held bunkers leaving nothing but crushed concrete and shattered steel to mark their location. And still, the ferry continued. Far from River City, the ferry became coated in fog as it approached a distant lighthouse. As the Amerigo creeped forward, Marceline noticed that the entire ocean was coated in fog. The ferry was like it was floating through a cloud as it approached the distant dock. When the ship docked, a crackle was heard over the intercom while the, presumably, hidden captain announced, End of the line. Outpost Island. Taking her things with her, Marceline walked onto the creaking dock while following it down. She watched as the dim light of the ferry grew further and further away, soon disappearing. Turning away from the now forgotten ferry, she faced the lighthouse, her only guide to where the hotel stood. There was no one on the dock, no one waiting and no one doing anything. There were no boats, no ships, nothing. Not even ropes or crates. Just fog, the creaking of the wood, and the splash of hidden waves. A perfect place for Marceline to change. Carefully taking off her jacket, she opened her suitcase and removed a familiar jean jacket. Running her hand across the golden crown on the red background, the first patch of her jacket, she slipped her arms through the, ar through the jacket and she felt a familiar flood fill her. Deep breath in deep breath out. Her stance felt different. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Her hair retracted into her head. Deep breath in, deep breath out. The cut of her clothes changed. A final deep breath in, and a final deep breath out. Where Marceline once kneeled, the Red Prince now stood. Now, let's get started, she told herself. Slipping her jacket for the weather over her jean jacket, she went forward. Normally, the cut of her clothes changed a lot more during a transformation, 
but she still needed the warm clothes on this island, apparently. The Tano Sea was very warm, so warm that people could swim year-round. And Isle City was often called the city with no winter around the world. But here on Outpost Island, the Red Prince could see her breath, and the fog was almost freezing even through her jacket as she strode towards the distant light. A path leading up to the hotel was wide and well paved, but at the edges she could see scrub grass was growing and she could see the shadows and silhouettes of crabs and rats scavenging just beyond the path. No one had bothered them for a long time and now they could hear her and they were trying to scamper out of her way. Approaching the hotel proper, Red could finally get a clearer look at it through the fog. It did resemble the pictures in a way. A large multi-story building with white marble and large windows with a lighthouse jutting out of the top. A bit awkwardly, but at the same time, it looked nothing like the pictures. In the pictures, the curtains were open, making the hotel look inviting. It was sunny, the sky was blue, and it was crowded. This hotel had closed curtains, no visible sun nor sky, and no people. Red could even see long red and green streaks from the windows. Mildew, rust, and other discolorations were starting to spread from the windows, streaking down much like the hotel itself was crying tears of blood. And the worst part of all of this? The silence. At the beach, there were still the sounds of waves. And on the paths, the rats and crabs made small scrabbling noises. Here, at the entrance, there was nothing. No air conditioning, no scrabbling, no buzz of electricity, no people. Just silence was the slowly rotating light of the lighthouse above faded in and out like a phantom. And of course, there was still no one to greet the Red Prince. A thought flickered through her mind. If there was no one to greet her, maybe they all left. Letters take time to travel, especially letters from areas as isolated as this one. She could head back to the dock, wait for the ferry to return tomorrow, and she could head back home. It would be safer, and a lot nicer. But something pulled on her to stay. She felt her hand rise to the knocker like a magnet. Marceline was scared, but the Red Prince? She was only strong and wise, and she had a job to do. Grabbing the knocker, she knocked three times. Just afterwards, the door creaked open, and deep inside the dark, a voice croaked out. Come in. Fred Prince stepped forward into the darkness of the outpost hotel. As the door slammed shut behind her, sealing away all the light of the outside world.